So hello, I'm Philip. I publish a lot of stuff on WebRTC Hacks, and I'm going to talk about WebRTC at Phoenix. So one of the first things that comes up if you search for WebRTC on Google is something about a WebRTC leak. And that's the thing, actually, because WebRTC is going to give your IP to JavaScript. So down there, or down in the WebRTC lib, WebRTC uses a process called ICE to establish connections between browsers or any other entity. And this ICE process gathers something called candidates, and each of those candidates contains an IP. It can be a private IP, public IP, or something else. And then that is sent to the peer via JavaScript, and then the whole ICE process establishes a connection to the other entity. Typically, it will punch a hole in your stupid NAT, which is a very, very complicated process because it needs to be coordinated on both sides. The timing is important, and it needs to be interoperable. And if you ever find a bug in that, you'll spend years fixing it. <laughs> but if we ignore this whole NAT thing, it's pretty easy. So one browser says, um, my IP is 10.0.0.1. I'm listening on port 12345. The other browser says, I'm um, 10.0.0.2 port 5569. And then they send some stunt packets and establish a connection. So it actually means that JavaScript can get your IP. And back in 2012, there was a cool website, netipcalf.com, which was showing your IP using just JavaScript. No calls to any server. And everyone was like, yeah, that's pretty cool. And it actually worked until Chrome 77 earlier this month and just showed your IP, IPv4, IPv6, any local IP, and now it's broken, thankfully. And some people got a bit concerned about that. There was a Chrome security bug filed about the Chrome WebRTC IP leakage, and Justin Uberti responded, this is by design. We want to do a connection between two local entities, so we need the IP addresses. We have no way around that requirement. And then that blew up a bit. So in February 2015, it came on Hacker News, and everyone was really scared about WebRTC leaking your IP. And there was this guy, Daniel Rösler, who wrote this great test page, and a lot of people have been referencing it since then. And in July 2015, WebRTC was in the New York Times. Not as an article, not as a video chat, but gathering IPs from users. And it was the first kind of really public malicious usage ever reported. And supposedly, it was for something like click fraud detection, bot identification, and stuff like that. This is one of the few cases where we actually know the purpose, because the people who were doing that talked to us. And in a nutshell, the problem is that this ICE stuff, we've been done it for more than 10 years in VoIP. It gathers IP, exchanges them to establish a connection. And now we mix that with the thing that JavaScript loads code from untrusted sources. And WebRTC is like we do allow JavaScript to, or we use JavaScript to make browsers have a call with each other. What people did combining all that was gather IPs without user consent, which is not what we had intended. And in 2016, Chrome got metrics for the WebRTC usage, and my friend Gustavo Garcia was browsing the web, had the WebRTC internals page open, and he saw connections from DoubleClick. And DoubleClick is not doing anything WebRTC related, so he was very annoyed and found it scary. And at the same time, we saw in the Chrome metrics that there was a huge jump over here in September. It quadrupled. It was four times what it was before. And the timing was just the same as this double-click incident, which somehow got fixed thanks to Justin. And the code for all that is pretty simple. You create a peer connection. You listen to the on-ice candidate event. If you get a candidate, you look at the candidate string, split it, take the fourth element, which is the IP address, and then you have your IP address. Then you create an offer on the peer connection, say you want to receive audio, and then you call set local description, which starts the ICE process. So it's just create offer, set local description. It can be done either with the data channel, so you create a data channel, or you could do things like receive only audio or video. 
And the thing is, there's no prompt for this. The user is not asked for any of this. So the user is not even aware this is happening. And then the IPs get extracted in the nice candidate event, and then people do something with them. We never really found out. We saw some tracking libraries, but it was very transparent what they do. And the thing is, this is not a normal WebRTC usage, because in WebRTC you have set local description and set local description uh, and set remote description, and both need to be called to establish a connection. So this behavior was actually pretty easy to track in the public Chrome metrics. And there have been a couple of attempts to solve it, like limit the candidates to the default route, so you only get a single candidate, not all of them, not any VPN candidates, unless get user media is called before. It was possible to limit the candidates you got via extension APIs. Both were tried. They probably limited the privacy impact a lot, but we still saw a lot of use of this pattern. And Safari was like, we don't like the privacy aspect of this. We were worried. So they didn't outgive any host candidates unless get user media was called when they launched with WebRTC. And as a result, many data channel use cases were broken with Safari initially. And the thing is, do we want a permission prompt? But if we have a permission prompt, what would it say? Would it say like, do you want to allow this web page to read your local IP address? How many users will understand that? And we had been seeing that back in the Flash RTMFP days, and it did work. And if you actually continue searching for this WebRTC le IP leak stuff, the results, the first three pages of the Google result will be VPN windows telling you what WebRTC is, why it's bad, and how they can help you avoid leaking your IP. And the thing is, last year we saw this research by the void set guy, and he was like, okay, a lot of those VPNs still leak with WebRTC. And it turns out those VPNs, what they call themselves, are just Chrome extensions which set a proxy and then forget to use the APIs available to restrict WebRTC in that case. If you want to use an extension that does it right, use the AFF privacy badger, but as a WebRTC developer, you will run into problems with it. So, there's actually an interesting solution to this problem, because if we just give out something that's not an IP address, we have solved the problem. So if we say, I'm listening on something.local port 12345 and other.local port whatever, we have solved the problem. And this was first proposed by the Safari people, so UN is here somewhere, over there. And Justin was like, the Safari team has come up with a clever approach to avoid disclosing IP addresses for host candidates. And nobody had thought of that before, and it's a pretty simple technique, so we were happy we had it. And the, it is as simple as generating a random host name, a UUID, at a dot .local, announce it via the multicast DNS protocol, which is something that came up within Apple. And when receiving that candidate, it, the browser will resolve it via MDNS again. And if both clients are in the same network, that actually works. And you get an IP address. And then ICE continues as it did before. The thing is, JavaScript does not learn the IP address. And the hostname is randomly generated. And ideally, there are no changes to your JavaScript application required. Because you're just sending this candidate string you see over there and the dot .local address to the other side, feed it into add ice candidate, and you're done. Well, unless your JavaScript is built together IPs, in which case you have a problem. But it's not our problem. And there are some interoperability issues. If you, the peer needs to at least ignore any dot .local candidates it doesn't understand. And in the end of year 2018, after the last cranky geeks, things started to look really bad because WebRTC was used by 8% of the Chrome page loads. And I don't know what that's in absolute numbers, but I assume it's a couple of billion loads per day. And half of those 8% were calling set local description, which is what is necessary to start the ICE candidate gathering. And if you compare that to the set remote description calls, which are necessary to actually establish a connection, that was like 0.04%. So 99 in 100 peer connections were used for IP gathering. 
we haven't really seen that it's really targeting WebRTC specifically. It was most of the time what we see from HTTP archive, part of a bigger fingerprinting package which collected like 50, 100 metrics on the client and then did something with that. But it's a huge problem. And the, in the WebRTC API, this IP leaks everywhere. It's on, in the on ice candidate event, it's in the PC local description, it's in the new sender detail as transport, ice transport, get selected candidate pair API, it's in the statistics API, you have special cases where you can get the IP without the other side sending you the candidate, and what the specification covers is even that if you have a turn server, the private IP would get sent to the turn server, and if the turn server cooperated with the website, it would still leak your IP. It would be an expensive attack, but we'll see. And if you find anything where you see this is missing, please file a bug, and it will get fixed pretty quickly. So exactly one year ago, this stuff was available in Chrome Canary. Justin tweeted about it, and I was like, yes, I'm going to test it. Of course, it started crashing immediately. And also interop with Firefox didn't work at all, broke again twice, so this required some iterations to get it right. And in February 2019, there was the first large-scale experiment in Chrome, still when get user media was active, and of course it broke with some servers, which were using libnice, and it was breaking an important Google Meet partner, so that didn't fly, so it's today no longer used when get, get user media is active, but if you're working on a server, please prepare for that event, because it might happen in the future. And in August 2019, we were really getting close to launching it in stable. There was a PSA, a public service announcement on the Discuss WebRTC list, private IP exp addresses exposed by WebRTC are changing to DNS host names, because the Google people want to notify the people affected by this, the WebRTC developers, but at the same time, we would like to not inform the people who just use it for gathering IPs. The thing about rolling this out is, how is this going to affect the connectivity, in particular in where two people are on the same network? Enterprise networks are particularly tricky for that, and these kinds of measurements not having any regression there are very, very hard. We saw that earlier this year when trying to deprecate detail as 1.0, that broke a lot of large services, even though it looked safe to do. And if we looked at Stack Overflow over the summer, people got very, very confused that WebRTC was no longer working for them to get the IP address. And let me say that WebRTC is not designed to get you an IP address. <laughs> Sorry, no, not the plan. And it's now enabled by default in Chrome 78, which is the current stable. It's for some reason not in enterprise installations because something didn't work out there, it seems. And if something breaks, no matter what, there's a good chance it's because of the MDNS stuff. Like this Discuss WebRTC post on November 3rd. Oh, it doesn't work with Chrome driver 78 anymore. And the browser doesn't establish a connection anymore. It works with older versions, but somehow it broke. It turned out to be that this was a case where the default for Chrome driver changed, so it was now using MDNS, and that broke the application. But in the browser, it still seemed to work because the browser had got user media permissions. And Safari has been shipping this stuff for a while, and it seems to work well. And just earlier today, I received news that it just landed in Firefox nightly. So we have pretty good coverage among browsers now. Did we solve the problem? I mean, the pro goal is to no longer get an IP without user consent here. And I think we have mostly achieved that, at least on the desktop. But we don't see any impact on the Chrome status metrics yet. So it's still at 4%, but those sites just get different data now. So maybe they haven't noticed yet. It will probably take a couple of months to see any impact of this. But until then, there's a lot of more work required. Like, we can do things to change those metrics. A lot of the usage is on HTTP, and there's a general trend to m only make powerful web APIs like WebRTC available on a secure context, like HTTPS. Get user media is only available there already, so removing it on HTTP will not break much. And the hope is that if we first make it useless and then break it, 
Hopefully, people won't migrate. We'll see how that works out. We will probably try to do it for get user media as well, because it doesn't make sense to couple the permission for the camera and access to your IP address. It, it's just the convenient prompt we have these days. So if you were working on a server, prepare your servers for that. And enterprise deployments are currently excluded from that because MDNS doesn't work well there, and there's a current proposal to just encrypt these candidates using a pre-shared key available in the enterprise configuration for Chrome. And with that, I'm done, actually.